Um, this is just going to be an informative session, so don't feel like you need to follow along to the kind of thing. Um, first of all, introductions. I'm Fiona. I work with Pete, um, and I have been doing so for just over a year now. Um, a little bit on my background, because it's quite relevant to what I'm talking about, and that is I started um, at Edinburgh University as a slide scanning technician, where I help users uh, make their images and later got introduced to the world of image analysis at that time. After seeing people manually count cells at a PC, um, I figured I'd better learn and teach people how to do it, so we don't have to do that in the future. Um, during lockdown, I switched into a software development position um, where leaving at Edinburgh University, uh, where I got a degree and then returned back to Edinburgh University, this time working with Pete as a research software engineer. Um, so what this background has given me is the perspective of both a user when looking at QPath, but also as a developer. And these can be quite contrasting and different at times. Um, but it's been really useful in looking at trying to improve the overall user experience of QPath that affects everybody. Um, so that's why my main focus at the moment is on user experience. Um, and hopefully I can get some feedback from you guys today on your user experience and potentially improvements that we could make. Uh, so first of all, what is it? For those that don't know, um, it is just quite simply your overall experience while using uh, the application, while interacting with it and doing your workflows. Um, there's lots of things that contribute towards it that can make it good or bad, which I've listed here. Um, the first of which is the design, which is the general aesthetic of the, the software. Um, Ideally, you could go really fancy with your design, but then it could impact the function. Uh, so there's a fine balance you've got to keep there. Usability, a really important one, is how easy is the software to actually use? Additionally, uh, is it intuitive? Do you have to keep looking at the documentation? Or uh, do you, can you actually do what you need to do with the software? You might not be able to give you the results you want because that depends on the input, but hopefully we can give you the format and the output. Um, additionally, consistency is really important. So an example of this is uh, in Windows, if you want to close an application, you go to the top right corner um, and Mac, other way around. If you were to mix this up as you're doing your analysis in the application and you want to close a window and it wasn't where you thought it was going to be, that can interrupt your, your flow and therefore affect the user experience. Um, accessibility. Very important one with regards to making sure that the software is accessible to all people, no matter the uh, ability, as well as uh, including people that have disabilities and those that have uh, English not as their first language. Um, adaptability is linked in with that, where uh, we can provide ways of changing the interface or the program to suit your, uh, these people. So for example, color blindness, you can change the channel colors so that they avoid, say, red green. Uh, if you're very colorblind. Um, feedback. This one is just quite simply following an action. So such as if you click on something, does the software tell you that something has been done, it's doing something, or has something gone wrong? Um, and then performance is regarding the speed of how quickly it tells you what's happening and what's going on. Um, and we all know the, the pains of lag when yeah, watching or streaming something online. Um, and the last one here is error handling. So when things do go wrong, does it tell you? Because um, yeah, if there's a silent error, then potentially your results could be affected without you knowing, and then that would affect the reproducibility. Um, so yeah, all these contribute towards a user experience, and it's important that we consider them all when developing QPath. Um, Similarly, it's also really important that we address the different types of users that we have. Uh, each tend to have their own um, requirements. Um, some I've listed here. And yeah, the, um, so yeah, for example, novices, uh, they tend to require intuitive workflows uh, and ideally interfaces that aren't visually complex as that could be intimidating, can throw people off. Uh, and disencouraging them from using the software. Uh, in contrast to that, we've got the experienced users who tend to want cutting edge tools 
um, and all the options to change all the like parameters in the functions, which isn't great for a novice, but yeah, it's done with uh, experienced users and a lot of this in QCAST has been snuck into the, the scripting side of things. So if you want to go beyond the basic features, that's when you have to script. Um, but we can try and reduce that potentially. Um, accessibility requirements, as I mentioned before, with the um, with the color blindness, you can change the channel colors. Um, but there's other ones as well. Um, occasional users. Uh, these are people that will learn the software, go away for three months, do their lab analysis, come back to the software, and realize that they're not so familiar with what they're doing anymore. So normally that would involve going back to the documentation, but if we can keep the workflow intuitive, then hopefully that minimizes how much is forgotten in between uh, the time done. Uh, power users, people that for example, just want to script, they don't want to use the mouse, they want to use keyboard shortcuts for everything. And um, we need to make sure that there's tools that are there for those people. Um, and yeah, the last ones, viewers and annotators, they don't want to use any of the back end processes, they're just there to, to draw their annotations on specific regions um, and potentially share. But yeah, there's more user types, this is not a definitive list, um, but it is really important that we consider uh, a variety of people's perspectives and not just one. So it's really important that we, we can get as much as possible. So as you go through your user, uh, ex sorry, your user experience with QPath in the engine analysis, you'll hopefully look lovely and calm like this. Um, but we we know this isn't the reality, and sometimes you tend to maybe look a bit more like those ones. Um, so if you get frustrated, lost, panicked, um, or even scared. Uh, we want to know when that happens, particularly I want to know when it happens, even if you don't know why, if we can sort of spot an area where that can be improved, then we can look into it further. And while I'm up here, I'm just going to share some useful UX tips. Um, yep, so some uh, useful tips and tricks um, for improving your user experience while using QPath is being able to change the appearance, which some of you may have already spotted in this section here. You can change from light to dark mode. Uh, I normally use dark mode, but present presentations are tend to be better in light mode. Um, you can also do this from this little preference cog up here uh, in the appearance section, which has been covered previously. Um, so yeah, you can do changes there. Um, additionally, a new feature in 0 0.5, as uh, badge notifications, please excuse me while I artificially reduce some errors. Oh, so you can see up here, there's two uh, notifications on these badges. Um, this is a new feature that we put in place to try and navigate users to where things have gone wrong or how you can get help. So the first thing here, the question mark, is the help tool. Um, so this, as I said, it's newly implemented, so there's many possible things that could be added to it, but it guides the user in a, in a sort of way, if, if you're unsure, you've just opened the software, you're not sure what you're doing, it can tell you here that there's no project open and there's no image open. So you can then follow that by opening up any project, it's just in those folders. Yeah, and you can see that that's cleared. Additionally, with this, you can provide more or get more context uh, when looking through or doing your processes. So as you see, as I hover over certain things, the context help is changing um, with regards to what I'm hovering over at the time. Um, so if you're confused going through your process, then be sure to check out uh, this additional um, content. Additionally, the help tool will show you if there's something changed in the image that could impact your viewing experience or just general things that um yeah just general things so yeah like here the fact that i've inverted the background image makes the image look different so it's alerting me that it's doing so and you'll find more of these throughout the software but i cannot show you them all right now um next up is when things do go wrong and you don't know what's happening, you don't have to fix it and you want to reach out for help or even just look into it a bit further, we have the log 
tool here. And this was developed by Leo uh, in the QPath team. And what it does is it details um, what's going on behind the curtain uh, in the software. So you can filter through. I made some artificial early warnings here just to uh, yeah, demonstrate because I didn't want to count on there actually being an error, which normally happens in my demonstrations. Um, but you can filter through, or sorry, you can check through the errors just by simply clicking down here, my warnings. Additionally, you can filter what you're seeing um, using these presets up here. You see the errors. Um, and yeah, additionally, very important, if you do have an error and you need to share it with somebody, then if you select on it, it will tell you the information about it here. You can either press copy down in the right corner or command C, control C, and then take that somewhere and uh, paste it. And then that will detail the full error out in text format that then a developer or your image analysis expert can hopefully decipher and improve. Um, and last thing while I'm up here is some handy uh, keyboard shortcuts that I've already mentioned. The first being Command L. Uh, if you are not sure where to find a tool that you need, I highly recommend this. So you can, yep, if you, if you know the name of it, but you can't find it in the menus, you can use Control L. Um, and additionally, if you're looking around your slide, if you press shift and the arrow keys, it's not going to work on this one, is it? There you go. And um, so make sure your image is selected. If you're selected on one of the folders at the side or images at the side, uh, your viewing experience might differ with regards to keyboard shortcuts. Um, but you can press, press shift and then the arrow keys to zoom in and out. And additionally, you can pan over the image just by using the arrow keys on their own. And that is the last of my uh, useful tips.